three, two, one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's co-op radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one. Powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Awesome. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Giuseppe Ganchi, and I'm here in studio with Mr. Darren Gaylor, my co-host. I don't know why I'm saying studio, but uh, we're not in studio. Uh, I, I think you're subconsciously answering the question of whether or not we're going to go back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. For those of you that follow our show, we've been out of the studio because of COVID for so long, uh, but they just opened the studio back up um uh last week and so we need to make that decision on whether or not we're going to go back to the studio yeah um, and that's so... vancouver co-op radio i mean you know cfro 100.5 fm it's uh it's it's been around for many many years and it Long was time, yeah. it, it was it was a great thing to be a part of i mean we're still a part of it we're still mm -hmm. on air you know but not live in the studio like not live in the studio so the shows we played a week late uh because it takes a week to get them to, on the station you know what co-op radio thanks for giving us an hour to talk about recovery addiction recovery mental health wellness uh every week if you uh, want to make a donation co-op radio especially now uh, could always use some support you can go to co-opradio.org make a donation you can even make a donation in honor of our show and we kind of get brownie points if you do so so make sure you put our names on it well talk recovery day wanted anyway and shout out to last door and westminster house for supporting uh, the show on a weekly basis as well you know we like to start the show off with some uh, news that affects uh, people like us and uh, i'm pretty excited um a couple projects uh, you know we we wear multiple hats here and for the i'm, I'm a chair of the recovery capital conference and uh, that is happening on april 12th and 13th in calgary so we're all going to calgary to do this recovery conference it's almost sold out um, I mean, it's it's really got this national flair to it. Uh, today, we just got um, a rooming list from the hotel. Like over 150 hotel rooms have been booked, so that means people yes. from like across Canada are actually getting on a plane and going to the conference. So I'm super excited about it. And and uh, it's not just about rubber chicken; it's about um, engaging in recovery oriented responses to build recovery capital to help us, you know, get out of this addiction crisis that we're in. Uh, but it also puts a big focus, you know, everybody always says relapse is a chronic relapsing disease. You know, there's some research out there from this uh, Canadian, uh, um, from the CCSA that's, uh, you know, out of their research, about 50% of people that actually initiate recovery relapse. So let's talk about prevention and recovery capital is a great relapse prevention tool building on your strengths. So you can go to recoverycapitalconference.com take a look at uh, that website and if you're able there's about 80 tickets left um so i'm super excited about that because i mean i've been so nervous like I, <laughs> conferences aren't cheap darren like they're expensive yeah. you gotta pay for flights hotels meals and, and it's not like the venues like oh you're a charity this you know they have a maximum minimum not maximum <laughs> you can spend whatever they have a minimum spend and that's like six figures so you're responsible for that and and uh, they don't care if people don't show up. You got to pay that bill. So, so I'm glad that we're getting close to um, being able to make this, you know, not just good for recovery, but an opportunity to not lose money and an opportunity to, to you know, the, there's a lot of addiction conferences that are fully funded by big pharma. This conference isn't one of those. It's a recovery conference for occupational health leaders and healthcare professionals. Uh, it, and just just from my experience i mean sure I'm, it's going to sound biased but yeah i've been to those conferences and and you like right within the first 30 seconds of you know the main speakers you can hear the agenda like it, it is so obvious and and that's the purpose and whatever that that's that's why they're there and 
you know, going to the recovery capital conference, like, I mean, it, it, it's just, it's, it's the speakers I, I want to hear. I need to hear the speakers that remind me that, you know, client care, the individual uh, and their, and their, their, their all around health is is what they're speaking about and and educating people about and it's it's a breath of fresh air man yeah pretty excited yeah. we got two guests on the show today so we need to get to them but i do want to let everybody know how super excited i am if you're on my facebook page you'd probably seen the post a couple of days ago and then yesterday uh vancouver pride is bringing Hi, back the vancouver pride parade it's going to be on july 31st i think and uh clean sober and proud clean sober and proud.com you want to be part of go to better app search for better at my better my recovery app in your play store there's a i'll add you to the group we're doing all our planning meetings for clean sober and proud in our app this year betterapp.ca and uh, yeah we're gonna build a float to make up for the last two years that we missed the parade so i don't know how big that's gonna be but it's gonna be pretty big so if you want to be part of we're gonna bring back the clean sober and proud parade float because the vancouver pride parade is back uh stay tuned to our facebook pages for all of that but uh, you're listening to talk recovery radio you can watch us on youtube if you are hit subscribe and uh, if you're watching us on your spotify's and itunes and restreaming there you know follow us like us share us you know we're trying to our best eight years of shows and uh we're pretty proud of what we've accomplished and we get to talk recovery with uh people with lived experience people who wrote books doctors experts and uh, some amazing people and uh, darren as i bring the guests in who, who where is my mouse oh no we got a problem houston there it goes darren who are we talking recovery with today well, I mean, I'm super excited. I, I love, I love our show uh, and the guests that we we have on. I mean, sometimes it's very specific in topic, and you know, other times we get individuals that you know remind me of that uh, that statement. You know, be the change you want to be in the world. So um, today we get to talk recovery with Charlotte Sister C Farrell. I love and, it. Yes. Hi, Charlotte, are you there? You were there a little while ago. Turns on her video. Uh, picture there of her she face. is. Oh. <laughs> there I guess it was waiting me to acknowledge that I was being recorded. Oh, right, uh, right. Uh, so welcome to the show, Charlotte Sista C. Farrell, uh, a dramatic poet, script writer, indie filmmaker, uh, producer of Speak Up Radio Show at uh, cjsf.ca, uh, that's here in Vancouver. Also a podcast called Powered by Age. Uh, I love this, that you are a star, an acronym <laughs> for speaker, teacher, author with remarkable results. Um, welcome Very to the nice. show. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I, I mean, you've done, you know, you, you were a resident of Los Angeles. Um, you know, you've been on fac faculty with universities of Phoenix, um, working with uh, University of Toronto with the public health department, um, nutritional uh, guidance with, with veterans, um, and then like uh, an independent poetry therapy work. Um, you do so much and i and i guess my first question is all of this work that you do what what is your ultimate purpose like what is it that that you hope to attain from all these things that you've done and, and continue to do let me first say i'm not doing them all at the same time <laughs> and in my seventh decade <laughs> right on Congratulations. <laughs> and partly it's it's really I want to help people live happier, healthy lives. And mm. I started off my career thinking it was going to go one way. I was working as a nutritionist, working in public health and making my happy way back to the health department in Toronto after doing a workshop for teens on stress and a stressed out woman hit my car knocked me to the side. I had a brain hematoma and a spinal injury. And then I learned that a lot of what I had learned in standard 
you know, ADA nutrition, it didn't work. I couldn't get my energy back. Doctors gave me these big vials. I had three tall vials of, of pills. Yeah. And poetry was kind of the little bird that came along and said, life is going to be different. Because when I was in, I spent eight days in a neurology ward in um, Mississauga. And the words would run around the page. So being able to, the first sentence I was able to write was my life must be fun. <laughs> and the first other things I wrote were poems that were really cynical. They were poems about pills, you know, pills in the doctor. If only his pen could heal me because he was writing all this stuff. Right. So it was kind of from the work that I got with a holistic, wonderful chiropractor in Toronto, Don Fitzritson who started teaching me about shifting, you know, being able to shift pain, that there was something other than these vials of pills. So yes. doing my recovery, I met people doing different holistic forms and began to practice those. And then I had a mentor who was an actress <laughs> and she was doing these shows. I, 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 well, I had to go to, I had to go to Los Angeles. I could not take the cold in my back. And so, <laughs> It would just lock. Yeah. <laughs> and six months after the accident, I wrote a letter to the medical officer of health then saying, it is this word, inimical. I think it's the one time in my life I've used inimical. Anyhow, it means it didn't make sense <laughs> for me to be working on a team project to help communities understand when drugs were coming into the community. When I had to take a drug to unthaw my legs so I could walk, a drug prescribed to me to make my brain think I wasn't having pain, a pill to make my stomach adjust. And I said, I'm stopping that and I'm just need to be out for a while. And so the people that I met, many people who did succumb to being locked into these drugs that they give, give you, uh, I, I, I developed, got a lot of, um, extra determination. I didn't want that to happen to me, but because the communities that I was in, chiropractic, homeopathy, etc., I learned some techniques that could help work with people. And it, it, it's so, it's so interesting. I mean, you're describing, you know, just an average, you know, woman, you know, driving in her car, getting in an accident. I mean, working with addicts, of course, you know, we, we've heard many stories of people getting in an accident and then developing an addiction to the pain uh, medication that they're, they're then given. Um, but usually it's, you know, it's childhood, it's traumas, it's, you know, all of these self-esteem issues, uh, you know, it, that, that are the, the forefront of, of one's addiction. But like people such as yourself, they, they just trust the doctor. They just, they take that piece of paper and they go. And I'm wondering, like, what was it that, that changed your mind that got you to, to say, I don't, I don't trust this. I don't, I don't want to continue with this and, and, and go to a holistic approach. What did you know at that point already? Well, just early in the time that I was, was off, first of all, they give people far too little time to heal from a head injury. And part of the push, I was thinking, this is ridiculous. I work in public health and I have a, a, a most people were good, but I had a at the time a supervisor who was, when are you going to get back in here? We let you work at home a month. And so the doctors, the medical people were just pushing this thing that I knew at the end, you know, cripples, hurts, and addicts people. Fortunately, having a chiropractor who was using neuromuscular stimulation, a number right. of other things told me there is another path and being able to use what I knew from cancer research, that there's research that helps people visualize a part of the body where they're having a pain or a challenge, let warriors, knights or whatever fight at that point. But I, the initial belief that there was something better from that really came from finding help and, with and, that, that doctor. And did, uh, you find, did you find you healed from the pain in a holistic way? Was there a point where there was some you know, medication required to balance out what wasn't, you know, completely fulfilling the healing? Like, 
what was no, the... it was dramatically different it was so dramatically different and funny enough a couple of years before i had argued with the same uh chiropractor in a public forum about health and i said yeah. that's ridiculous you know it's kind of the bias you know from women's history month one of the things is breaking the bias and in my radio show one of the things we're talking about is breaking the bias that holistic health is hokey you know you can't get yes. well from it uh, so I, I had a mistrust, you know, it, it, and I just saw a difference. I was able to see that you could transfer pain. You could have a visualization that could transfer. I would take the elephant's foot on my head, make it into a reggae dancing cap, because I love dancing reggae, and throw it out into the crowd. And so it was from seeing that, but also when my insurance ran out for that, a company in Ontario had a neuromuscular stimulation machine that they wanted somebody to go to Los Angeles. It was like, I was feeling suicidal. I accepted this thing to be relocated there to work for them, to go and tell doctors that we had an equipment that could reduce the healing timetable by six months. <laughs> and if a person had 10 treatments, they could reduce it down to four to six. And this was really great in Toronto. People accepted that. They were looking for heal speeding up the healing timetable. People told me, you're lucky they didn't throw you off one of those buildings on Wilshire because these people want every, you know, thing that's been prescribed, every treatment that's been prescribed. And so I found then again within, um, people started asking me to teach. I, I worked at uh, Charles Drew University and in their allied health program, people in all the programs were together. And one of them was the people going into to be certified as substance abuse counselors. I taught a public uh, speaking course and really cried my awareness of the depth to which people's lives had been disrupted by drugs. You know, helped me to understand things that I hadn't personally experienced. I became even more committed to uh, being an advocate, being someone who could not turn up my nose when people were telling what their problem was, but also work on using healing modalities I had learned, you know, to work with them. You so said something. Was, you, sorry, you, 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 go ahead, Darren. Go ahead, Darren. No, go ahead. I was just saying. So that now, now you had that sense of 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 truth within yourself. Like the 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 car crash interrupted the the potential hypocrisy that you would have been continuing on and right. and now and now you can find some truth in in the process of healing and directed it towards substance use counselors people with addiction i mean i mean these are people with pain right i mean right this and and from part of my own journey within la i have a single neurologist who told me two years out uh, what you remember, that's as good as it's going to get. Well, two years out, I was driving my kids to a after school parks program, and it would take me a half an hour or so to find my way back to pick them up. Uh, I had the good fortune of having what I call a fairy godmother, someone, an actress uh, in Los Angeles who was a mentor to me, it was Virginia Capers, and she um, was the director of the Lafayette Players uh, Drama Club workshop and they one of the things the company had to do was learn classical black poetry the harlem renaissance poetry and i wanted to be in a show <laughs> and she she also uh because she knew the health problem i was having she introduced me to a chiropractor in los angeles um, who used homeopathy and a lot of eastern mind body you know work so i was getting some help going through that. In fact, that doctor hired me to do promotion for the homeopathy class, but I learned again, things that uh, just aren't in the mainstream of what people are told. When people get a plan, when they have an injury, when something happens where uh, they're recommended to take pain pills, Oxycontin, a whole list of things yep. I would say. They don't even say, you know, or perhaps you could 
go into a, so any of these therapies that use mind body healing. You might use poetry. There's so much documentation about poetry as a healing form. Never mentioned to me by any of the doctors that were paid all the money that the health system will pay. That's a, that's a message that we hear a lot. It's like you, you said at the very beginning of the show, it's like, I only wish the doctor's pen would heal me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's true. It's just like, I remember myself being in a doctor's office with all this stuff stuff you know the doctor's pen is not going to help me pay my rent because i spent it all on cocaine and you know what i mean like there's no pill that's going to fix that <laughs> and uh, and and here we are still you know um trying to use the doctor's pen I, I mean i really believe there needs to be um an opportunity where the doctor's pen is part of the healing process but isn't the only healing process and and you know you said it there's a bias out there i'm the doctor i'm the phd i'm the one with the script pad i'm the boss and that's a really dangerous place because, you know, and another thing that I'm hearing you say too, healthcare isn't just something you get, <laughs> you know, the healthcare, you have to work, you have to be part of that process. Like I know somebody who's, who's, you know, has, has a diagnosis and, and he can just sit there and wait for healthcare to write him his scripts. But instead it's like he works at all of these holistic methods, um, you know, researching himself, taking the doctor's advice and suggestion, but also, you know, researching, but it's work, you know what I mean? You just take a pill and sit down and wait for it to be healed. It's like a full-time job to get well. And, and, and I don't think that gets promoted enough, just like addiction recovery. Like it's not just go to the doctors and get your oat or your, right. or your medication assisted treatment. It's about doing all the work along with that to help build your recovery capital. So you touched on Women's History Month. Do you find um you know when walking into a doctor's office that like how did you get over that so for for people listening to the show that feel like the doctor's just not listening to them like i especially if it's a male doctor because in canada right now doctors are so limited you know you have women seeing men doctors um how do they get through that how did you get through that and 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 so forth well, I think I, I just got really got mad because I thought mad. <laughs> uh, you know, at the time I was a single divorced parent, I had three children who ate real food and I needed to work but not be pushed. So in some cases I found women have much more compassion about some things, but then others just realizing working in a health unit where a person pressuring me to hurry up and get on with it, hurry up and get back here. Uh, can force you then to go into the system and just listen to what another person would say. But it was making me so mad because I wasn't getting better. I had one day where I sat holding on to the side of the, you know, my dresser because the medications they gave me was making me, this, this is ridiculous. So that finding another um, practitioner, the, the chiropractor was also a male, but it was just something different in following the oath of Hippocrates, which says the wise physician listens to his patient and is counseled by. And I'm, I'm, I, I've fired about six doctors <laughs> over a lifetime now for different things I've, I've dealt with. And most of them have been male doctors who do just make you feel like, child, sit down, I'm God, do what yeah. I say. Yeah. But I have also had uh, I've had different other challenges. If I had listened to doctors, I would not have three children because <laughs> they told me I was going to come in for it, 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 This is not a health show. Anyhow, it's okay. one thing they were oh, saying they were going to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a health show. It's exploratory. A health show. You know, yeah. a lot of people who do also end up in addictions for things because they go in for exploratory surgeries for things like exploratory surgeries for their uterus and they're expecting one thing to happen and people take it out and the crushedness of having that happen then maybe later at another point finding out that may not have happened there are people that i know that are in recovery or who've gone through substance abuse for the pain of having something taken taken out of their body, whether it's, uh, I, I, I've had a, f a fight with the doctor, my, my brother and I fired a doctor recently because 
he was having pain and it, uh, the medicine he was taking was making his stomach hurt. Well, the doctor said he had scheduled him to take out his gallbladder. And I said, based on what? And that's one of the things I do in advocacy with people is tell people, challenge and question. The person is not the maker of the earth and you need to raise questions. So, so instead of taking a look at the medication, let's just take your gallbladder let's out. Just yeah. take the gallbladder it's a, out. It's a checkbox. We've all become checkboxes and so forth. Uh, you know, before we get into our second guest in the second half show, I, we really wanted to talk to you too about, you know, poetry in a setting of addiction, recovery, and a treatment center, and a recovery center. So, so I mean, I, I, I just got out of psychosis. I'm like, just finished doing tons of crystal math. I'm like, I, I don't even know how to get dressed. How is poetry going to help? <laughs> well, the first place that I did poetry with people in recovery was with, with, with a lockdown uh, recovery center in Los Angeles, where they had hired me initially to just do nutrition assessments. But uh, I ended one of the sessions with a poem. And some of the people said, well, can you come back and do that? So I have found where a group like Narca, many groups have invited me to come in and share some poetry. And then I invite people uh, to write a poem to an organ in their body that they feel has been damaged. And I have seen grown men cry. I've done all this stuff, but when you had me write that poem to my heart, that made me think so differently of my, my heart. So I think it's different ways that I've had an entryway into talking with people. Sometimes it's just sharing my poetry and then I'll ask them to write a poem about that. I do have some poems that I wrote when I was at a point of anger or a point of depression, even in a su suicidal mode. So it opens up a comfort level of them saying it's not me coming to do sonnets <laughs> or something, but really working with, from my experience, how something as simple as a five line poem. And so it depends on other groups like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, they don't normally let anybody come who's not an alcoholic. But I was doing a, an event at a church where the, the, the kitchen was on the back side of the room people had the uh, their meetings. And so uh, I, 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 gave them, I gave them one of the poems and they tasted some of the food and they said, well, this poem is pretty good. Maybe you could come in and share a poem with the group. And so... <laughs> from the invitation to be in, but also being able to relate. And I do some poems that at a point in desperate, of desperation, but also at another point that shows the triumph. How poetry can, everyone calls skipping and smiling. And it's about, I'm working at this veterans program and I said, the director's looking down, sees me skipping and smiling, and he's wondering, should he send me up to the test room? <laughs> and then I tell him it's not, you know, it's substance, but it's just, feeling so good and so free to be here. So I think it's just being able to work with people at the point where they are, people that have been in a lockdown facility and where we're just doing something to feel better about life to people who want to, you know, in taking public speaking, they want to learn to speak better so that they can speak to other people or advocate for other people. So those are different ways that I've worked with people with different types of, of programs. Um, and it's been an ongoing healing for me because the more I've seen getting it out of your system, cleaning the anger out of your system, being able to speak to the thing, whether it's to the doctors, through the substance, speak to the thing that's got you chained, that, that, that gives people sort of a power to feel that they can be in control of other things. So it's just not the be all of healing, but it's an important component of uh, getting well, being able to stay well, being able to uh, express yourself to other people. Some of the poets that in, um, some of the people that were in substance abuse uh, counselor in that course, when they took the public speaking course and then they did the poetry course, they found it was something that they could use when they were working with their clients. Uh, I've had psychologists sometimes at poetry sessions when they've had open mic, I thought, well, they need us. we need a doctor in here. Uh, I've had some events where um, I, I had 300 hours that were monitored by having a psychiatrist was sitting in and monitoring the, the work that I was doing with people just in 
journaling, and in doing poetry as part of a recovery program. So those are some of the ways that I've been able to use poetry and see and know that there's a lot of stuff that's been written about the beneficial effects of poetry. That's Darren, that Darren I have one more question. So, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not, uh, me myself, I can't sing. Um, I can't write music. I I can't draw a picture of a stick man. Like I just, I, I just don't have that creative hand to paper. I can do other stuff, but I just can't, when it's me and a piece of paper, I'm no good. So, so somebody's listening, like, how does, you know, how does one, you know, who's like, I, I can't write poetry. Like, I'm not gonna, like, it, it can't help me. Um, how, what do you say to that person and how can they, you know, do they write a couple lines and try it well, out? Yeah, I would say first forget all of the, th I hated poetry in, in school when they said, you got to rhyme this syllable and that syllable, no sit down with the paper and write, I love this job, or I hate this room. But just first writing, it's, it's letting your emotions, being honest and not trying to fit somebody else's form. And it gives permission to something in yourself. So I've had a lot of people that never wrote a poem, I, uh, write a poem because it's the permission you give yourself to express how you're feeling. Poetry is an expression of your feelings. And if you have a little, I have these little notebook pads that I have in my purse and different things. If you have a point, there's something inside you that stops saying, oh, you're not creative. They say, oh, you're giving me permission to tell you what I think about you and how you do whatever. So that's the first thing is just starting to write and the pattern starts to merge because as you feel free to say that thing inside you feels free to say what it wants to say then you get into saying more then you might read a book or go to a poetry event but it's first of all it's just taking permission to write lines about how and what you feel onto paper that's that's excellent uh again we're on vancouver co-op radio cfro 100.5 fm and here on facebook live we've been chatting with uh charlotte sister c farrell um i mean I, I love the conversation of of you know merging holistic approaches as well as you know psychiatric approaches and 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 you know counseling approaches and i and i think we've you know we've built like Giuseppe calls them silos where it's one or the other right and, and, and that and that 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 stigma that recovery I think is, is very much in line with the whole holistic you know approaches that you were seeking or that you were finding successful it's like that's what I mean recovery is very much a holistic approach to healing you know, the soul and the spirit. And, and, and I think it, it, it gets that same sort of stigma, you know, that's, it, it, it's, it doesn't follow the numbers and, you know, stats and all of this crap that it's not evidence-based. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so it, it's just, it's always refreshing talking to someone such as yourself that, especially, you know, in the beginning, you weren't about this. It was literally a, a car crash moment in your life you know, that, that, that got you, forced you to sort of seek, you know, what, what's, uh, what you felt to be your truth. And uh, we appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, check out um, Charlotte's website, charlotteferrell.com. Uh, and she has a Facebook page as well, C. Farrell and Associates. Uh, so check it out, follow, follow Charlotte and uh, you take care and all the best to you. You can hear me at 10 a.m. on Fridays on CJSF. All <laughs> right, <CA>. perfect. <laughs> we will do that. Thanks so much for being on Thank the show, Thank you for Charlotte. asking me. Thank yeah, you. take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good luck with everything. Take care. Thank you. Take care. All right, we're moving on with our second guest. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Talk Recovery Radio. We've got Dr. Rob Kelly. Hello, Dr. Rob Kelly. Welcome to the show. Um, Dr. Kelly is coming to us with a, a person with personal history uh, when it comes to addiction recovery. I think we all have some history, but uh, uh, Rob's got a story. Um, but also, uh, as you can tell by the name, he's a doctor. And uh, now he's trying. Uh, he's not trying. He is helping people. Um, and we're going to talk about some uh, interesting models of care and some concepts and ideas that Dr. Kelly has. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kelly. 
Thank you, guys. Good to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, welcome back. Yes, we had you on our show a while ago. It's always nice to see uh, people come back still doing what needs to be done to, to help people. So, uh, you know, let's touch on a little bit of the history. Um, uh, you know, not only are you a doctor, but uh, you're also a member of the club, I guess. Uh, a, a little. Were you involved in addiction before you became a doctor? Um, no, I wasn't. I became a, a doctor, especially to... Um, work on uh, addictive uh, behaviors and alcoholism and, and drug addiction. So okay. I suffer, but I did suffer badly when I was a younger okay. first drink at the age of nine and then it kind of took its toll over the years. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people don't, I mean, like drinking at nine, that, I mean, I remember I didn't drink at nine. I was, I was in high school by the time I actually started to get drunk, but uh, you know, we, we, where, where are you from anyway? Where, where are you, where are we talking to you from? I'm actually San Antonio, Texas. That's where okay. I currently reside. But obviously, from the accent, you can tell I'm from uh, Manchester in England. But I've been okay. in Texas for 15 years now. Okay, excellent. Well, welcome to Texas. I, I one place I haven't been yet. One thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you know, there's many pathways to recovery, mm-hmm. and and it seems like you know when you you know what. <sighs> We say there's a siloed healthcare system. You talk to some people, it's like, oh, everything works. But the reality is people specialize in certain areas of healthcare when it comes to addiction. So can you share, if I was, uh, you know, coming to you as an alcoholic or as a heroin addict, do you have different approaches? Do you treat them the same? Well, both illnesses show up the same. However, alcoholics are born. And drug addicts are made and what i mean oh, by that is alcohol- i've never heard I that know. on the show i've never <laughs> heard know. that on the show this is 25 eight, years of eight years research. of shows okay yeah. so tell us about that well you can uh, her, alcoholism is hereditary it's a predisposition passed down from generation to generation so you can always trace alcoholism in your family drug addiction not so much so from the very first drink of alcohol because you hear this all the time i'm allergic to alcohol well let's get more definite than that I'm allergic to the ethanol in alcohol. And what happens is when I'm born this way, I'm born with a basal ganglia and a hypothalamus different to other people. When I introduce alcohol in, that's when the new neuroscience comes in and tells me that it sets up an event going through until whenever you get to chronic alcoholism. Drug drug addiction is slightly different. You have to become addicted to drugs Most people get addicted in the doctor's office, unfortunately, most heroin addicts that come to us, and then it becomes an addiction and they both present the same, both hard to come off, but it's about changing the brain. It's about changing the way we think, changing the central nervous system that reacts. So the mind sits inside the brain. The mind is different to the brain. Okay, so the mind sits inside. When we make a mind up to do something, we can then redevelop and remold the brain. Most alcoholics are born with far more self-sabotaging neural pathways than good neural pathways. So that's why we can go a couple of days, weeks, months, years looking really good, but soon enough, we're gonna <clears throat> self-sabotage and pull that old structure that we built for ourselves and family down on top of us. And we repeat and repeat, that's the basal ganglia part of my brain. That needs to be chinked in and changed if we're gonna change anything. So one, this is something that's, that you'll find interesting. Uh, alcohol has got 1% to do with alcoholism and drug addiction has got 1% to do with drug addiction. And that's a new neuroscience that we, that we, uh, that we've studied. And totally, totally agree with that. Uh, One of your quotes is the problem is not our drinking. It it is our thinking. Um, I, we, we had a show, uh, last week, uh, um, talked about fetal alcohol, um, syndrome and, and is it, is it ridiculous to think whatever the, the, the spending would be on, on testing or, or, you know, understanding the, the, the genetic parents or grandparents when, when kids are born? Like, is, is that completely ridiculous? Or is that, would that even be a solution if, if, if there was a way of saying, okay, you know, this, this child has an alcoholic gene or you know this hereditary yeah. <clears throat> i think it's hard to say straight away because the testing's not gone on too far I mean, anything that 
pushes us forward and more understanding regarding addiction is obviously great. But if we're looking at a predisposition that's passed down from generation to generation, then how do we change that is the question. Right. Uh, the only way I've got changing right now is education. So people often say to me, what, what, does alcoholism in my family, Rob? When should we start teaching our children? Six, seven, eight years old. You know, you know we're is, we're doing it. We're we're doing a conference in uh, in a couple of weeks, and one of the the speakers is from Iceland and the Icelandic model, which I I really really love to talk about because they had the worst one of the worst global alcohol consumption rates uh, decades ago, and and they invested in children and they invested in community and they call it Planet Youth, and you know they don't have fundraisers selling pizzas and chocolate bars to send kids to soccer games like it's all paid for, and and years later. Um, they have some of the lowest alcohol consumption rates because they they didn't prescribe medications to all the kids. They they invested in community. Some of the the um, uh, and it's something that I, I wish everybody in Canada and the U.S. heard because we don't talk enough about prevention. We we wait till you're on fire before we we start to put the fire out. You know, it's just like can we like just not light the match? But um, I don't know. We're just a small radio show in Vancouver. I don't know if we'll change the world. But I we wanted to know. talk to you about uh, these uh, these big words um, uh, for especially for a mom at home with a 17 year old kid who's using or drinking, um, utilizing neuro-linguistic programming, mm. somatic <laughs> experiencing techniques, and behavior observation. So those are the three things. I hope this show will help somebody at home kind of go to their clinic and say, this is what I want. So, so what are those three things? I'll start with NLP first. It's been around the longest neuro of the brain language different language the way we're teaching you M mostly uh, subconscious when we're planting words that you need to hear and phrases in between a, a, a session or a therapy session uh, and programming we're literally programming the brain so the certain sentences certain uh, ideas that when we're talking to you and you're taking therapy we're going to plant in most people are suffer from uh, addiction alcoholism or addiction uh, low self-esteem, no confidence, uh, suffer from trauma. Trauma is the gateway drug, by the way. It's not um, weed, as they say, it's, um, it's trauma. So we look at the trauma and then we replace, we start replacing that with, with uh, therapy that changes the way you think. And you can change the way somebody thinks in seconds. You've only got to say somebody, I've read this experiment, walk past somebody with nice sneakers on. Hey buddy, nice sneakers. Oh, thank you. Then watch him walk away. He's looking down at his sneakers every couple of seconds because he just complimented it. It's kind of that idea. We did an experiment with Coca-Cola once. Great drink, love it. But the guy in Texas loved his Dr. Pepper. However, after three months of treatment, I got my driver to take him through a set round Dallas that passed three billboards for Coca-Cola. <clears throat> when he got out of the car, we placed one of our external staff drinking Coca-Cola. He doesn't know the person. We get into the elevator. There's another person drinking Coca-Cola. He gets up to the office. He walks in and the staff say to him, Dr. Pepper is usual. And he said, no, I'll tell you what, give me one of them Coca-Colas. That's what we're talking about. So we can replace verbiage and images into somebody. Somatic experience is very interesting. SE as we call it, because that's looking at the body and the central nervous system. So somatic experience to the normal layman would be the gut feeling. We don't really use it today, but the gut feeling goes back generations to the tribal days. When one of them would get a gut feeling, that means there's danger in it. So the hypothalamus, which is at the base towards the back, would say run or get ready to fight. That's what it says to them. So these feelings that we get, we can spot a relapse now a day or a week or even a month before it happens. And that's the education part of it. Because like you said, by the time I pick the drink up, it's too late. You know, it's all, and I'm, you're never going to stop me drinking. So let's look at a week or a month before where my behavior changes. So if the disease lives in my subconscious brain, which it does, I don't know when I'm going to relapse. But when we monitor behavior, when we look at behavior and see how they change. Typical example, we had a model that we were working with, a, a lady. She would have salads every day. My sober coach would take her out for lunch. One day she said, I'll tell you what, let's go for McDonald's. That's the red flag. That's the behavior change. We brought us straight back into the office. 
We asked to search your bags, he said, yeah. And there was the half bottle of vodka in the purse. So this is the stuff we look at. Everybody wants to concentrate on the alcohol and the drugs. Why? You have nothing <laughs> to do with it. That just ends up being the symptom. It's like my spots to my chicken pots. Yeah. Well, I can see you've got chicken pots with the spots. Yeah. That's oh. the that's the blessing. Of, I, I don't know where you're at with long term residential inpatient treatment, but where I work and, and behind the show, it's people live here three months, six months, sometimes a year. Yep. And so it's like it's a real big learning experience where you have somebody with 10 months of recovery, no substances, and they're behaving you know, in a way, and you're like, well, I guess it's not the drugs because that was yeah. 10 months ago. Right. And so there's exactly. this, 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 this curtain falls. It's like, oh my God, like I need to change. It's not like whether drugs are in my system or not, I'm still lustful, greedy, immature, mm. self-righteous, you know, and, and if you do step work, it's character defects. If you do other stuff, it's, you know, it's all kind of the same thing. It's all about behavior, but I have a question why are we as a society so against if you were to go on twitter right now and say it's not the drugs it's you like mm. you're you're mm. you know you're you're it's your personality it's your behavior that needs to change you'll get crucified in social media like it's it's it, we're in a system especially in vancouver it's the trauma it's society it's in, it's it's intergenerational trauma like it's all of that it has nothing to do with me so so help me unravel that like like you can't blame and i use the word addict because i identify as an addict you can't blame the addict it's everything else and then you come into recovery and it's like it's not everybody else it's you so what's going on <laughs> we, we have a self-imposed crisis which means it's down to me so what's not down to me is the choice of drink or drug while I'm, you know, heading towards addiction. That's taken off me. The choice is taken off me. Okay. What is up to you <clears throat> is first of all, admitting, hey, I've got a problem here. And then education and dialogue around that problem to find out that I am selfish. The biggest, there's a great book out there. It's called The Big Book. And, and it tells us that selfishness kills us. Not the drugs, not the alcohol, selfishness. So when I'm still acting out, like you just said, you know, if I'm still acting out alcoholically, which I can without even touching a drink, then I'm selfish. I get irritable. I don't care about anybody else. Then I self-sabotage. All the behavior around uh, the alcoholic brain is self-sabotage. Now, when we flip that over and they get well and they realize it's me, I need to change. How do I do it? And they become open and willing to, to good treatment that guarantees them because we guarantee our, our work we're the only company in the world that offers money back guarantee. Then we do a five year case management study. So we see these guys over the five years. That's when they have to realize at the beginning that A, we know what we're doing, B, our success rate is crazy. So we, we have an advantage where people come to us go, Dr. Rob, what do I need to do? What's the problem? You know, and because me, well, all of us here, I guess, we've been there and done it. So when you're walking into a therapist that has no, no idea about my position when I would hurt you, my family, my kids, my wife, to get to a bottle of vodka, then how can she understand what I'm going through? So I think the connection there from one alcoholic to another going, hey, here's the deal. Here's the latest research that we've been studying for 25 years. We're the only people that's been studying to its depth because there's no money in recovery. If the pharmaceutical companies can't give you a pill or they can't stick you in treatment for, for 30 grand a month, who wants to know? Well, we want to know. And this is the latest research that we've been practicing for the last 10 years. And it works. So I hope that answers the question. But oh, it, it totally tough. does. Yep. It is tough. It's you tough. Know, people will always want to fight against it. Go, well, you can't be recovered from this. Yeah, you can. You can't fully. Yeah, you can. You can yeah. be anybody you want. I'm, this is the guy that was homeless. This is the guy that sold his kids out for alcohol. This is the guy that stabbed his wife three times one night because she won't let him finish drinking. Me? Yeah, me. Anybody can change. We can change the brain unless you've had serious brain damage. Therefore, change the way we think, change our behavior, change our life. You can be anybody you want to be because I don't know about you guys, but if I'm not taking drugs and drinking, my life has to be amazing. Yeah, that's it. Like it, the the inspiration has to be there. I mean, I just said this to somebody the other day. At, at like, I'm coming up to 16 years, you know, clean and sober. And the more clean I get, and the more 
you know, life throws at me, kids, death, relationships. Mm -hmm. The more I get through these, these events, the more weak, crazy, just immature, inexperienced, ignorant person. I like, it becomes more clear. And I never had that clarity kicking dope being clean within that week. I'm not using anymore seven days, 10 days, 30 days. Yeah. I'm, I am convinced I am done. I am finished. I have stopped using mm. and I never get to the point where I see myself at that point, mm. crazy and needing help. And I constantly remind people the person that needs all change. Like we don't need to do a big drug history and the events that took place and what you did when you were using that's we all have that story and that's not the thing that needs to be fixed let's look at the person that's seven days clean 10 days clean 30 days clean let's see what he's fighting for let's see what he's about let's see where his responsibilities lie and hopefully slap him around until he realizes that he's completely crazy now not that physically was- slapping. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, yeah, <laughs> a disclaimer there. We don't slap anybody. Uh, yeah. I do. I do. Uh, yeah. And now exactly and, what you mean. And- because when you set the alcohol and drugs away, Darren, we're left with me. That's you know? it. And, and I'm I'm in a mess. And I'm, I'm what well, I don't know anything. I want to self sabotage. I hurt everybody. I'm like an infectious disease when I go through this deal. So and I'm making decisions really to go back to work. To move yeah. back in with with my yes. wife and kids, yes. I'm making I'm making decision when I'm done treatment, and yet there isn't a force that that can stop that, and and so that's that's where you know the unconscious, subconscious, the 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 invitation to seeing, you know, that that being the problem is absolutely necessary. And internal right. dialogue. Internal dialogue is very, very important. If I drop right. a pen on the floor, oh, you stupid idiot. Whoa, <laughs> stop that straight away. Because they, if you suffer from the addictive mind, the subconscious brain loves that stuff. Mm-hmm. And it will store that stuff. And, the, and, the, and when that will come to fruition to the prefrontal cortex is when you go for that girl, that job, that car, that house. Oh, you stupid idiot. Internal dialogue kills more people than alcohol. Period. It's, it's that it's that murderous voice. So you're in Texas. Um, do you do? It's called the Dr. Rob Kelly Recovery Group. Um, so do you do virtual uh, services at all? If someone's really liking what they're hearing and they want to be part of? Yes, we have five offices around the world. But yes, we're, we're 95 percent telehealth now. Uh, oh, okay. I, I didn't so, know yeah, that. We, okay. We can see anybody anywhere? But we have Spain. We have uh, Manchester. We have. Um, uh, in, we have Dallas, we have uh, San Antonio, so yeah, we're everywhere. Okay. Everywhere. Uh, so your website is for our listeners and viewers. RobKelly.com with two B's, R O B B K E L L Y dot com. Jump on there. There's a button actually. You can speak direct to me. Call me. I'll give you a five minute pet talk that will change your life. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I was actually going to ask that. So do they talk to you or so apparently you can right talk to Dr. It. Rob yeah, Kelly. Right through to um, me. He's all over Facebook. If you click on the link and, and, and the post here, you'll get to his Facebook, Instagram and, and so forth. So you can follow and, and be part of uh, some of the techniques that he was talking about earlier. Um, and I love the idea. Anybody, uh, even a guy who stabbed his wife, that's, that's, that's another first on our show too um you know you can recover and 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 i'm assuming forgiveness for yourself and and so forth and and all that a uh, really big piece so if you're listening to this show but you're also listening to that voice in your head that from our first guest you can't write poetry and from our second guest that you can't recover you know those are murderous voices you don't need them and 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 you can get through it you can change your brain you can change your mind and you can change your heart which is the the three things that we all need to to keep working on um thanks for being on the show we really appreciate your time. And uh, and like you said, the links are in, in the bio. Darren, always good to see you. Yes. And and if you got that, we're super excited. Just want to remind everybody, Vancouver Pride just announced the return of the parade. So we're starting our Clean Sober Proud Committee for our float. It's always an annual tradition, one of the best floats in the parade. Um, so you can, uh, you know, direct message us. We'll get you in contact with, uh, with, the con- with the committee. Dr. Rob Kelly, always good to see you. Take care. Thanks for being on our show. Darren, see you next Thursday. Thank you.
Okay, bye everyone. Take care.